In his first lecture, he argued against what he called the view from Dover Beach, after Matthew Arnold's famous poetic lament for lost faith. This view holds that modernity is simply a falling away from earlier moral horizons, a matter of decline, loss, and forgetfulness. Instead, Professor Taylor proposed that we view worrying aspects of modernity, like people's obsessive quest for self-fulfillment, in a different context, not as forgetfulness of morality, but as a degeneration of a genuine moral ideal. Looking at the contemporary scene this way has very different consequences than the view from Dover Beach. Instead of simply condemning contemporary mores, one can try to awaken the higher impulse within them. What is needed, Professor Taylor says, is a work of retrieval, a search for the moral sources of modernity. In the second of his five Massey lectures, Charles Taylor begins that search. Tonight I want to start by describing and tracing the development of the modern ethic of self-fulfillment, as I described it yesterday. But tonight I'd like to give it a new name, a name that I think is more appropriate for it. And I want to talk about it as the ethic of authenticity. I picked this word up from a brilliant book by the American critic Lionel Trilling, Sincerity and Authenticity, which he published about 30 years ago, in which he actually goes into these two ideals, modern ideals, and distinguishes them. And in talking about the second of them, authenticity, he really picks up on what I want to examine here. So I want to use that word because I think it captures some of the force, as I hope everyone will see as I begin to describe this more. Now, the ethic of authenticity is extraordinarily recent in human history, which always surprises us because it's so rooted in our lives and so important for us, even when we try to deny it, that we find it hard to imagine that our ancestors... 250 years ago, wouldn't have understood a great deal of what we're talking about. It was born in the eight, late 18th century out of a very common moral stream in the 18th century. I think you could say it was born out of the uh, ethic of sentiment. The ethic of sentiment, which we find with great thinkers of the Scottish Enlightenment, like Francis Hutcheson, was itself a reaction against a kind of morality which is also very modern, the kind of austere morality which is grounded on a notion of right and wrong, living according to certain rules, where the sanction for the rules in those days was thought to be the will of God and the rewards and punishments that God would offer in the afterlife, the kind of ethic that seemed to have been espoused by John Locke. And, of course, the, the successors of that ethic go on today, perhaps not always or not more often in this theistic form of uh, being based on rewards and punishments by God, but an ethic which is concerned, above all, with discovering what the right thing is to do and molding our action on this, these demands of rightness. As against what the theorists of sentiment thought was this rather bloodless ethic, this ethic that seemed to give no place to the human heart, they developed the notion that God had planted in human beings, on the contrary, moral sentiments, a, a sense in one's emotional life of what was right and what was wrong, and one had to follow the voice of moral sentiment within oneself. And that came to be a very important stream of thinking in the 18th century, and in a way, it developed and took a new form in one of the most influential writers, perhaps the most influential writer of the whole century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau turned this idea into the notion of our having a voice of nature within, a voice that comes from our authentic being and that tells us what the right thing is to do. And the danger that stands before that voice, what can, in a sense, drown it out, is our dependence on other people, our entering society in such a way that we become dependent on the opinions of people around us, on their good opinion of us, on our reputation in their eyes. We kind of want to play up to them and be accepted by them. And in all these ways, we become dependent on others and lose the sense of 
dependence on ourselves, by which he means this voice within. In a, he sometimes talks of it in this image of a voice, sometimes his oral image is used, and sometimes he talks about it in terms of the very notion of sentiment. He talks about le sentiment de l'existence, the sentiment of our own existence. In this first transposition of the morality of sentiment, we're beginning to see emerge the modern form of individualism. Why? Well, because already the idea is being presented that in following the voice within, I am doing something which is opposed to depending on others, listening to others, molding my life on the expectations of others. I have to generate from out of myself and the voice within what I ought to do. That's the path of morality. You can see we're beginning to develop a morality not based on the notion of an externally imposed law, but based on the notion of something that emerges from the, from the heart. Rousseau is, of course, an absolutely extraordinary figure because he is the source of more than one basic, fundamental, powerful idea in the modern world. He's also the source of a conception of freedom, which I would call self-determining freedom, the idea that I'm free when I determine the conditions of my own existence from out of myself. And because he's the source of both of these, and because these ideas, I suppose, are a little bit linked together, we can easily mistake them for each other. That is, the notion that morality comes from a voice within, and the notion that we're called to a kind of self-determining freedom. They're close brothers or cousins, in a sense, but they aren't quite the same. And the fact that they can be confused will have fatal uh, consequences, as I want to talk about later on. But for the moment, let me make clear that the idea of following a voice within is not necessarily the same thing as saying that I reach my highest fulfillment just in virtue of the fact of choosing my own life. It's not the fact of choice, which is what is stressed by self-determining freedom, but the fact of following the voice which is authentically mine. Now, you've noticed in these last sentences that I've been using to try to explain was so that Several times I find myself using the word authentic, and that's, I think, because that's a natural way of putting it, even though it wasn't his word, I want to call this ethic the ethic of authenticity. It's an ethic that says what a human being ought to do is discover within himself or herself the voice or the impulse or the sense of what is right and to follow that. And it also tells us that this is not easy to do and that there are lots of factors in the human condition that tend to make this very hard to do because there's a tendency for us, for that voice to be drowned out by the influence of others, by the voice of conformity, by the pressure of others on us, all these externally derived forces which tend to drown it out, shut it up, make it inaudible to us which we have to fight against. So it's this is no sort of easy path, as this is conceived. Authenticity is not something that just comes to you naturally. It's something that very often has to be fought for. That is the germ of the ethic of authenticity. But now there's one more important twist, one more important turn here, which we have to see this going through before we have the fully-fledged contemporary view that we live by. And that is something that really happened after Rousseau, but was developed by people who very much were inspired by him and built on him. And these were the, the writers of what you might call the Romantic Generation, though not all of them are, properly speaking, Romantics. The writers who go over the, the boundary of the 18th and 19th century in Germany, perhaps first of all, but also in England and elsewhere. I want to take as my uh, representative target figure a German critic and writer, Herder, who I think articulated one of the first and best articulations of this new change. What is this new development, this new twist? Well, it takes off from this idea that each one of us must listen to, as it were, the voice within or the impulse within, but it adds something very crucial to it. The notion that each one of us, in listening to that voice within, 
is called on to lead a form of life, a way of being a human, which is peculiar to himself or herself. It's not just that we should listen to the voice within because it's the general voice of human morality, that it also is, but also that it tells us a peculiar way of being human, which is really ours. And now we can see a double reason, if you like, why we shouldn't simply take our morality from outside. Not just that proper nature of human beings is, is to listen to the voice within, but that if we simply listened to those outside, we would get a model, a way of being human that isn't properly ours, that wasn't meant for us. We can only find our proper way of being, which is something original and different, by looking within ourselves. And that is what I want to call the full-blown ethic of authenticity. It's the ethic of authenticity which not only calls on us to be true, if you like, to ourselves, but calls on us to be true to ourselves also because there's something very special and original, which each one of us is, which can only be found that way. Now I've started to use the word originality along with authenticity, and that lets us in on another aspect of this ethic, that it's, it's one which has made us conceive ethical life as something very closely interwoven with and connected with aesthetic life, or if you like, art. We understand right away the demand for originality as a demand that has its proper place in the artistic domain. And in applying this notion of originality to human lives, We've been developing a mode of thinking which has made us begin to see human lives on the analogy of works of art. There's been a close interweaving of artistic fulfillment, artistic creation, and human lives. And that has been part and parcel, of course, of a very important feature of modern culture. Our sense of the heroic nature of the artist, our willingness in the 20th century to take the opinions of artists with great seriousness as though they were people who had insight in, into things. There's been a massive shift in our whole culture here, to which I want to come back later, that's been involved in this ethic of authenticity, and one that's raised very questionable, very questionable things as well. But all that is part of the ethic of authenticity, which um, calls on each of us to be our own person. Herder had a wonderful way of putting it, he said each human being has his or her own measure. It is where what I'm measuring my life against when I ask myself if it's a fulfilled or unfulfilled life is a measure which is mine. I can't decide whether my life is a success, whether my life has been fulfilled by looking at your life or the measure of your life. I have to find my own measure and dis discovering that, carry it out. To a lot of people, what I've been saying will seem absolutely self-evident and banal. And in a way, that's exactly what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to argue. That this ethic has become very deeply entrenched in our whole thinking and way of life. To other people, what I'm saying will perhaps not sound strange, but make them maybe uneasy. And that's because some of the words I've been using are words that they, and they, they find it difficult to relate to or maybe even make them squirm. That's because, of course, of something I mentioned yesterday, that this ethic is very often lived in rather debased forms. And so we have people running around talking about self-fulfillment, and we may have some of these people we've met in our lives who in their living out their so-called self-fulfillment, do either rather trivial or ridiculous things, or perhaps very egoistic things or very hurtful things, and we shy away from this language. And maybe the same may be true for some people with the term authenticity. But let's stand back for a minute from the allergy that any one of you might have to one of one or other of these terms, and try to see how deeply the ideas I'm talking about have bitten into our way of life or have entered into our self-understanding. Everybody understands 
if I talk of somebody's life as a wasted life or somebody who didn't realize his or her potential or someone who didn't really find themselves. I recognize each one of these terms I'm using are, is probably making another group of people listening to me squirm because that particular term is one that they found misused or abused. But the point I'm trying to get across, if we reflect a little bit, is that some or other of this whole range of terms, each one of us in some way or other relates to because they, the idea that we have, a particular way of being ourselves, has become so deeply part of our lives. And so I want to try to get us to see beyond a particular range of ways of saying this, which are just legion in our culture, and to see beyond the particular ones that may have turned any one of you off, and to understand and to grasp how broadly and deeply this way of seeing things has come down to us. And then be as astonished as we ought to be that we have come to accept this as a human ideal in light of the whole story of the human race, because I come back to the point I made at the beginning, that 200 years ago, this wouldn't have been self-evident, this wouldn't have been understandable. The understanding was that what was right and wrong was universally determined in terms of universal principles or laws or universal realizations of, the, of human nature was the same for all human beings. Of course, it was recognized that human beings were different. But the idea that the differences would have this moral significance, that my being the particular person I am, lays on me the obligation of being my, of living my particular kind of life, that would have seemed strange and weird. The very language of authenticity, and let's remember in its etymological origins, which has the, the notion of the self in it, right? The idea of being myself. The very notion of authenticity would have been impossible for our ancestors of, let's say, 300 years ago to understand. And yet to us, it is totally understandable, whether we like it or not, whether we approve of the forms around us or not. It's something we immediately grasp. That's the measure of how much this way of thinking has entered our very cultural bloodstream. And it can take an immense variety of expressions, all the way from this fine Greek-derived word authenticity down to something like doing your own thing. It's the same idea at work at every level of realization. Now, what I want to show, as I was saying yesterday, is that it's in the very nature of this ideal that it can bring us from the lower forms up to the higher ones, that it can get into the debased forms and bring them back to their highest and most authentic realization. And yesterday I was talking about two such, the way in which this ethic of authenticity, as I want to call it, can somehow lead people to adopt a kind of relativism in which they believe that we can't criticize each other's moral views on one hand. And on the other hand, a kind of atomism where people get shaken loose from their commitments and engagements in to other people in families and communities. Of course, that means that, that implies that, that assumes that, as I said yesterday, we can argue about this. We can say to someone, look, your way of living the ethic of authenticity is not the right one. It assumes that the relativism we're talking about is wrong, that we actually can argue. And let me say a few words before I launch into a bit of an argument about why I think that we can reason about these matters. Moral reasoning is sometimes thought to be, in the end, impossible. That is, that you can't convince people that they're right or wrong about their moral views, because people have an exaggeratedly extreme notion of what it demands. They sometimes think that if moral reasoning were valid, if you really could convince somebody that something was right, you'd have to start as it were, from the ground up, maybe with somebody who didn't accept any moral commitments at all, had no moral ideas, was totally amoral, and you'd have to take that person from point zero, as it were, and build up and build up by sheer undeniable argument to the point where he was accepting your view. 
But that's not the way moral argument is actually carried on, because that's, of course, not the way human beings ever really are. We carry on moral argument always within the bounds of certain agreements, certain common intuitions, a certain sense that something is right. Always, I would say, I'm saying within some sense, of course, it may differ greatly with people with a culture or a view very far removed from ourselves. We may find it hard to discover the common ground from which we can start. But nevertheless, to argue is to start from some common ground. Now, in the case we're looking at here, my whole point is that those who are, let's say, deeply into a kind of moral relativism, on the grounds of, developed out of a, an ethic of authenticity, and someone like myself that finds this ethic admirable and wants to convince them that that's not the right path, we have a lot of common ground. We have the common ground precisely of this ethic of self-fulfillment or being true to oneself. But we have more than that. We not only have this ethic, but we also have certain understood background features of the human condition that we both share, that we can both be got to recognize when we bring them out. And so moral argument in this kind of area consists to a large part not in developing syllogisms or proofs of the kind you find in mathematics. It consists for a great degree in articulating. Articulating things that were there in the background half understood, more or less seen or felt, but haven't been really appreciated because they haven't been brought out. And in bringing them out, we can hope to show that some ways of living and acting are better than others. And that's exactly what I want to do in giving, I won't say really full-blown arguments because there isn't time here, but at least argument sketches today and also tomorrow, whereby we can, I can try to show that these debased forms of the ethic of authenticity really don't live up to its demands. On Ideas tonight, you're listening to the second of the 1991 Massey Lectures. The series is called The Malaise of Modernity, and the lecturer is Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor. All right, I want to do this in regard to the two kinds of sliding away or debasement, if you like, in the ethic of authenticity that I mentioned today and also yesterday, it slide towards atomism, it slide towards relativism. Today, let me look at the slide towards relativism. That is the idea that if we really took it seriously that people should be true to themselves, then we oughtn't to criticize others. We oughtn't to believe that we can say to others that they are wrong in the values that they espouse. We ought to as it were, let each person accept that each person can be sovereign in their own values. Why is this wrong? Why is it wrong, especially in the light of the ethic of authenticity? Well, let me try to look at this in the following terms. When you come to understand what it is to define yourself, to determine, in other words, in what your originality consists, you can readily see, with a bit of reflection, that you can't do this unless you have some background sense of what is really significant. I mean, let's take it in terms of the question of how you, somebody defines their identity, which is one way of putting the, this point of finding one's originality defining what makes you different from others, what makes you special, what gives your life its meaning or its sense. Let me take a ridiculous example. I may be the only person with exactly 3,732 hairs on my head, or with exactly the same height as some tree on the Siberian plain. But, so what? Can that be how I define myself? It sounds ridiculous, and it is ridiculous. If somebody asks me to define myself, what my life is about, what gives meaning to my life, I might say something like, um, 
I define myself by amb my ability to articulate important truths, or maybe to jump into another Meche altogether, maybe play the hammer clavier like no one else has ever played it, or perhaps I might say that what really matters to me is I'm reviving the tradition of my ancestors. Any one of these three answers and others like that, we would immediately recognize as something like understandable self-definitions. Yes, I can see how someone's life can be organized around those things. Now, what's the difference between these three answers on one hand and having 3,732 hairs and the other one I mentioned on the other? Well, because we understand right away that the three good answers I gave pick out properties that have real human significance, like articulating important truths or playing this great work of Beethoven in an unparalleled fashion. They have real human significance. Whereas having exactly 3,732 hairs on my head doesn't. Well, you might say doesn't unless we find some special story. I mean, you can always find some special context in a given culture where let's say the number 3,732 is a sacred number and that marks me out as some kind of important religious leader. But if you don't put that context in and note what we've done by putting that context in, we've, we've related this otherwise trivial property of a number of hairs to something really significant in human life, like the religious life of a society. Unless we do that, it would just be incomprehensible. We'd think that somebody was playing a joke on us, or maybe this was some Dadaist uh, work of art or modern play theater, in the theater of the absurd if somebody answered our question, what's your life all about, by citing the number of hairs he has on his head. So what has all this got to do with relativism? Well, what this little thought experiment showed, this rather crazy experiment about the number of hairs and so on, what it shows is how we actually reason about our lives how we reason about morality, and in particular, how we reason about what gives our lives sense about our own identity. And it shows that when we reason about these things, we have to take some things as given. In other words, you couldn't imagine someone reasoning about their lives, about some important moral issue, and when you push them to the final ground, the final point on which everything rested, you would come to a decision that they were taking to make something important or make something unimportant. Rather, when you think out your life yourself or when you're forced to defend your own position in life in argument with someone else, you find yourself articulating the grounds, the sense of significance, the sense of importance that you've taken as the background to your argument and that you're now bringing out. What this little thought experiment shows is the way in which, in the, in the fashion that we actually argue and we actually reason and, reason and we actually think things out, we all take something very important as given in our argument and not as simply chosen. But once there are things out there we don't decide that are already given, then there has to be the basis for criticisms we can offer, one to the other. But you might also say something else comes out of this little fable here, particularly the example of the hares, that the things we do take as background can differ greatly from one person to another and for even more from one culture to another. So I had this fanciful notion a minute ago that perhaps the exact number of hairs in my head might in some other society have really important religious significance, and that brings out to us how how different we can find other people, how different we can be, how hard it can be to align what we take for granted with what they take for granted. And this certainly has been one of the really important grounds that has led people to adopt a relativistic position because it does seem that we can't there's no way we can arbitrate the difference between us but here too when we look at what's going on we can see that the differences between 
these two societies, our own and this imagined one, aren't simply based on premises that come out of nowhere to the effect that some number has religious significance for one society and not for another. On the contrary, there is always a very large and rich surrounding picture, surrounding understanding of human life, in this case of the religious dimension of human life, within which this number has the significance it has. And because there is this large and rich surrounding, this is something about which we can argue, something of which we can discuss, something which is probably even contested in that society between different variants of different parties and different versions of its culture. The fact is that the nature of human reasoning, whether it be our own reasoning about our own lives, our discussions with others where we differ, our attempts to understand and criticize very different societies, we always find that the foundation of our beliefs, of our position, are not simply premises which are there in a take-it-or-leave-it fashion, but large, ramifying, and complex views about what's important in human life, which invite further discrimination, further interpretation, further argument. What we never get to in any of these discussions, our own deliberation or our debates with others, what we never get to is simple starting points which are what you might call just surds, just sitting there as unargued, unarguable, undiscussable axioms which we can't get behind and which is it were determine everything else that we believe. But that's what makes the relativist picture so deeply wrong. Because we don't get back to these simple axioms, and in particular because we can't understand, therefore, our fundamental positions as just either brute givens or as simply chosen, there always is something we can say to each other, some criticisms we can offer to each other, some issues we can take up with each other. I give you my plan of life, and you say, well, there's something I don't quite see in that. That doesn't take account of, it doesn't relate you to this or that very important, significant thing in human life. You just left that out of your life. And that's a criticism I'm making of you. It's a criticism. When you say that to me, I have to listen to you. I may have a reasoned argument why I've left that out. I may want to argue that's not quite as important as you think and other things are of, of great importance. But I can't simply sweep that aside by saying that doesn't count for me because I've decided that it won't count. There is room, there has to be room for criticism of each other. And now we can see right away that there's an important distinction to make here which is lost from view in the kind of soft relativism that I've been talking about. The fact that we've moved in the modern age to an ethic of authenticity, that is from a view that thought that all the major issues of morality were to be put in universal terms to a view which says there are some issues which have to do with how I ought to be, where the answer is peculiar to myself. The fact that there's, in other words, an important personal dimension to the good life for me, namely my finding the life that properly suits me, doesn't mean at all that I have the right to decide what that is. It doesn't mean at all that I am not open to criticism. Because you can criticize me for failing to live my life. It's just as much, if you like, a question of right and wrong, whether I'm living my life, the life proper for me, as it could have been 200 to 300 years ago, whether I'm living the right life for human beings in general. The fact, in other words, that the good life is one that has a personal index to it, that there's a good life for each one of us, doesn't in any way mean that there isn't here a question of right and wrong. Well, we might say there is, after all, another way that the culture of authenticity might generate this view that each one of us can choose for himself or herself. 
Because one thing we might connect with the culture of authenticity is the idea that people should choose their own lives, right? That they should not simply slide into them, but be active, be agents in the choice of their own lives. I mentioned this yesterday in talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, where I pointed out that he is one of the great founders or culprits, depending on your point of view, one of the great originators of the ethic of authenticity, and also the originator of a, a notion of freedom, self-determining freedom. And I said that these two were crucially not the same because the idea that my life ought to be chosen by me is not really the same as the notion that my life has a certain form, which is properly mine, which I have to cleave to. Okay, it's important to keep them apart, but somebody might reply, nevertheless, these are two separate ideals, but isn't it true that we also are deeply into the ideal of choice in the modern world, the idea that somebody ought to be the agent of their own lives? And that, that indeed is true. I mean, let me quote now another major 19th century philosopher that I've been keeping in reserve until now, who I think is an admirable exponent, both of the ethic of authenticity and of this modern idea of choice. And I'm talking about John Stuart Mill in perhaps his most famous work, his essay on liberty. And there he says in chapter 3, that in order to be full human beings, we need more than a capacity for what he calls ape-like imitation. He goes on, A person whose desires and impulses are his own, are the expression of his own nature, as it has been developed and modified by his own culture, is said to have character. That's the end of the quote. It's a wonderful statement. What Mill is doing there is, of course, is he's annexing this word character, which has been very much part of the of the vocabulary of morality for centuries, but used, of course, in a quite different pre-authenticity sense, he's annexing that for the ethic of authenticity because he's saying somebody has character when his desires and impulses are his own. And then he goes on, if a person possesses any tolerable amount of common sense and experience, his own mode of laying out his existence is the best, not because the, it is the best in itself, but because it is his own mode. And there again, Mill, and throughout that work, Mill emphasizes the importance of our being active choosers of our own lives. And so there's nothing terribly strange, perhaps, in saying, although this, this notion of choice is not the, exactly the same as the ethic of authenticity, it fits well with it, and it's part of what we are very much involved in, have taken in as our, as our heritage, in these last 200 years. Yes. But then let's look again at what's involved in this ethic of choice. Supposing I say, like uh, Mill does here, that a life can't be really a good life for anyone, not only unless it's the life proper to them, but also it can only be the good life if it's something that they have actively chosen as against being sort of sliding into it or being led into it by others. All right. That indeed is so. But then, let that be so. Let us agree on that. But then even here, we see right away that there is, as it were, a fixed background that has to be accepted as fixed for this to be true. If it's the case that a life isn't good unless it's chosen, that's because we have some understanding of the human condition such that, independent of anybody's will or choice, there is something noble or courageous or significant about giving shape to your own life. That there is something noble or courageous or significant in this is not something that you choose. It, too, becomes an ideal that is, as it were, given to you by the nature of human life. I mean, we have a picture here of life as being worthy because it's chosen, as against simply going with the flow or copping out or conforming with the masses. And this is something which is true of human life, not something that you choose. And so even taking that part of the ideal, that part of the ideal which seems to focus most on the individual choice, 
we see that it doesn't open the door for relativism. On the contrary, it opens another way in which you can criticize somebody's life. You can say to them, look, the life you're living, the values you're espousing are not really yours. They're not really chosen. You're not really into them. You're not authentically endorsing them. Once again, the very fact of looking at what's involved in authenticity, looking at what's involved in choice, shows that the facile relativism that has been drawn from this melts away or self-destructs or is shown to be incompatible with taking that ethic really seriously. As a matter of fact, we could turn this around and look at the same point from another angle and see what happens when we allow ourselves to make this mistake and to think that relativism is the proper conclusion to draw. And then what do we find ourselves saying? What do people who get into this relativism find themselves saying? They find themselves saying in the end that, well, you can't criticize this person's life because he or she has chosen it. That's their choice. They find themselves in the end making choice the only criterion of rightness. That the person has chosen it is a sufficient reason not to criticize it. But if you follow that thought out, then you dissolve all these horizons, backgrounds of significance. Then the most trivial choice on the part of those people could have the same importance as the most significant choice. They could determine their own lives as much by choosing strawberry ice cream as against walnut cream as they could in making the most significant career choice or a choice of the ultimate commitments. Everybody recognizes, of course, the absurdity if you push this to the very end. But we can also see how a climate in which choice is made the only criterion is one which ends up trivializing trivializing choices by putting them all on the same footing and producing among everyone, both those who live this kind of life and those who are looking at them from the outside, one of those senses of malaise about which I've been talking all along in these talks. That is a sense that something has been lost, that the lives are narrower and flatter. Exactly the kind of criticism we find Tocqueville making of individualism in his day that we found bloom making of some of the younger people. In other words, the slide downwards to an ethic which is grounded simply on choice, the notion, the relativistic notion that no one can criticize another for a life they've chosen, is a slide which produces the sense of trivialization, of a lack of significance, which dissolves, or maybe that's not the right word, which pushes to the distance and occludes the horizons of significance, within which alone the choice of one's life or the determination of one's identity makes sense. So we can see this two ways. We can see this connection between authenticity and continued sense of the significance, given significance of human life, either if we follow the logic out by trying to see what makes a choice, a choice of about identity and not something else, or if we see what makes us precisely ill at ease in the present-day culture of authenticity, where this intuition has been lost from sight and people have slid into relativism. So otherwise put, you, you can see the basis of an argument here whereby we could tell each other or perhaps remind ourselves that certain forms which are justified today on the basis of everybody being true to themselves or the culture of authenticity are actually betrayals of it and ought to be abandoned. We could see here a kind of argument which I will call an argument of retrieval where we can as we're reach back into the rather rich sources of the moral ideal which animates so many of our contemporaries and find again what it really involves and use that as a uh, 
standpoint from which we can criticize a lot of contemporary practice. If you take what I described yesterday as the view from Dover Beach, that is the view that the development of modern individualism is just to be understood negatively as the collapse and disappearance of old horizons, then you'll have nothing to say or know nowhere to stand to criticize this development except to shake people and say, remember morality, or once more think of something bigger than yourself. If you take the view, as I've been defending here, that the contemporary culture of authenticity emerges from this very powerful moral ideal I've been describing, then you will have something to say. You will have an argument to put forward. You will be able to engage in a kind of retrieval, as I've been describing it here. Well, this is what I've been doing in regard to the slide into relativism today by looking at the nature and background of the ethic of authenticity and trying to show that it takes us outside of relativism. Tomorrow, I want to do something of the same for the other kind of slide I mentioned before, the slide to atomism, the way in which individualism tends to occlude the value and importance of our commitments to communities around us.